Hey, welcome back to Believe the Target. My name is Eric Cortina. I have a very special guest for you guys today. He needs no introduction, Mr. David Tubb. How you doing, man? Eric, I'm good. Got all our problems done, and this this is a new chair, a little different spot, but that's okay. Let's see yeah. what see what quest questions you have. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't have many. I just want to have a conversation. I. I I mean, you've been around the shooting sports for a very long time, and uh, you know, from yes. the little that I that I understand, you've done silhouette, you've done uh, uh, obviously high power. I've seen right. you shoot a little bit of F glass. Right. I'm. You done pistol shooting, correct? Well, yeah, the, the sportsman's team challenge stuff. You had to be proficient with a rifle, pistol, and a shotgun. And of course, so. you're doing ELR now. So right. there's, uh, I kind of want to talk about how, where does, where does it all start for you? I know, I know your, uh, your dad was into shooting sports as well. So how does little right. David kind of get the, the itch to, uh, to do as much shooting as you've done in your life? Sure. sure. Well, you know, he came back from World War II and he liked to shoot. So, in the 50s, mid-50s, let's say, he started shooting competitive high power. And uh, <clears throat> he ran into Middleton Tompkins at some match. And uh, they struck up a friendship. And from there, then, you know, I had a BB gun when I was, I don't know, five or six. And that would have been in the 60s, let's say. And then I started shooting... <clears throat> Around, I shot high power, and I shot small bore, a small bore league that was in the area in the winter time. And then from there, I started shooting three position ISU stuff at DCU, and I still shot high power rifle. And then from there, then I delved off into the silhouette game, which was just showing up. And uh, but I shot it from let's say 75 to 93 and they were ready for me to leave at that point and uh still shooting high power along with high power you should have long range uh i shot the mobile prone for some time it was a good training aid and, uh you know just it, it just kind of all culminated you know a little bit here, a little bit there. In uh, '88, I shot, and I and I that was probably one of the better years I had, and I won the uh, the small bore silhouette light gun, heavy gun, the high power silhouette light gun, heavy gun, and the the arrangement of Camp Curry that crossed the course and the long range. I won both of those, so I won everything I entered. That year. So pretty good. Yeah, that's, I'd say anyway, that's pretty yeah, good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, I know across the course is something you obviously did. And, uh, what, can you explain what across the course is? Sure. It, it was the national match course. It used to start out and you shot 10 shots standing, 10 shots sitting, rapid fire, 60 seconds, 10 shots prone, rapid fire, 70 seconds, 20 shots, slow fire prone. 600 yards that was a that would be a 50 shot course then they shot 80 shot courses where you shot 20 everywhere and then they'd shoot a thousand uh, courses where you shoot 20 everywhere and you shoot the 600s twice and so that'd be a thousand point ag is that how it kind of worked out and normally uh at the matches that were regional level you got ciders a couple of ciders to start with uh, for Camp Perry, a long time though, when I shot it, uh, you got no ciders. It was cold bore all the way from the get go. Uh, at 200, all the way through. Now, I think they gave ciders at a thousand yards, but you didn't get any ciders <clears throat> at, uh, you know, short range, basically, which would be two, three, and 600 yards. And they instituted the ciders and they had a, I came in about the time they came up with a decimal target. Which would be an X ten nine eight seven so on and so forth instead of the five V target. So, of course, if you you didn't lose any points if you didn't shoot in the white with the five V target, so 
with a decimal target, you can shoot in the black and still lose points. Because mm-hmm. there's a nine ring in there. Yeah. So anyway, and even an eight ring at 600 depends on the size of the target and how they scaled it so you'd be able to have good definition between the bullseye and the, the white background, you know. So anyway, but that's how that worked. And so you shoot all kinds of conditions, you know, rain, sleet, snow, you know, mud, anything. They didn't. They didn't really postpone matches. They got a little bit better uh, at, you know, calling stuff off when the lightning started striking. But uh, for all what it was worth, usually it was, you know, it, and you just shoot in the wind. That's just what you did. So, and of course, where I live, it's windy. Wind's blowing today. Wind blows yesterday. Wind's going to blow tomorrow. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you had no choice but to get good at that. Uh, now, what were the cartridges that you guys were using for across the course? You know, they were evolved and, and they used to shoot 30 out six stuff. And when I started shooting, a lot of people were shooting 308s and they, they had converted M1s from 30 out sixes to 308s. M14 evolved. All the people were shooting model 70 bolt rifles, basically. And they were all 308s. And then from there, uh, you know, we, we started down the road and went to a 708. I shot that for several years. Then I went to a six, a 260, uh, Remington, which would be a 65. And from there, then I culminated down to a 243, shot a lot of 243 in silhouettes, so to speak, lighter recoil, uh, so to speak, better wind drift bullets, so on. And then in the very end, I ended up, you know, developing a cartridge called the 6XC, which is the predecessor to the all these sh- other short cartridges, everything but a BR, you know. It it came about, the 6XC came about about the same time that the 65 to 47 did. Same, same genre. And, uh, so anyway, that was a good cartridge and you know, fit it, it cycled. You shoot rapid fire, so stuff's got to function. It's got to, it's got to cycle through the. You got to load a stripper clip or a magazine box, so on and so forth. And, you know, to to get your rounds off in a in a in a timely manner, and obviously shoot a good score. Offhand, obviously, the single shot loading, and you know, long range or prone slow fire with single shot loading. But uh, everybody figured out if give me the give me the cartridge that doesn't kick. That's the one I want. Yeah, that seems to be the, the you know, the trend in everything. They start really big because they want the wind drift ability, and then they realize that it doesn't matter how much it drifts or doesn't drift if you can't handle the, the fatigue of the recoil for, mm-hmm. you know, long days of shooting. You know, the consistency that, is, is better than the uh, wind drift ability. That's right. No. But the, the thing that a big cartridge gives you is when you build a position, of course, this is a sling, you know, a lot of this, other than standing, everything else was a slink supported position. And so the people that evolved and learned how to shoot guns that kicked more developed, you know, positions that would enhance their ability to com- compete or complete their, their, their string. And today, the across the course shooters, all, most all of them are shooting a four power scope on an AR-15. And you really don't have to be able to develop a a position based on recoil from that. So you're gonna you would it would it would be harder for those people to turn around and shoot a big gun that kicked. So I Carl Bernowski and I talked about that more than once. And uh we we felt that we were probably from a you know, we got schooled better. It's like we we started out with iron sights and we got a scope at the end. As opposed to starting with a scope and and, and then getting get, get take a whip, you know, every time we shot it, it hit us in the eyeball or something, you know. <laughs> anyway, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You everybody's seen one of those. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Whatever. <laughs> so, so you developed the six XC. You know, it require. You know, it obviously had. Great ballistics, low recoil, right. and it fed great. Mm-hmm. How uh, did that improve your scores? 
I think it did. Absolutely. All those lighter kicking cartridges did. And, uh, you know, the, the reason was, is it, it, I guess a good way to go back and, and look at it is when you shot silhouette with a 308, you shoot 40 shots offhand. And a lot of times for me, you might flinch a shot or two in 40 rounds. Okay. Especially if the wind's blowing, that's that, that accentuates it because you're moving all over the place. And you, you got when you slid to the 708, maybe you only flinched one shot in 40 right? and in, in rough conditions. All right. And you turn around and you start shooting that, uh, the 6XC or the 243. You didn't have any of that. So back again, the gun that didn't kick gave you, if you, if you executed everything right, you got an extra hit or two. That was the idea is to shoot a 40, of course. Uh, cause there were 10, 10 chickens, 10 pigs, 10 turkeys and 10 rams from 200 meters to 500 meters. So, so you could see it then because you shot a 10 pound rifle and the recoil was much more of a problem, let's say, or something to overcome. Uh, and it's, and it's like now when I, when I would was shooting across the course and the long range and you turn around and shoot the Palma match. So you shot a six XC everywhere except the Palma match. And now you're shooting. 155 grand bullets or 185, you could shoot whatever you wanted. In a 308, well, guess what? You're back to the little pounding. It's, it's, it's got more recoil. It's, you know, it's inducing on you. But the fact is, is, uh, you can overcome it, but you gotta, you gotta work at it just a little bit harder to execute a shot. And across the course, what size are the targets? The, uh, 200 yard target had a, Three inch X ring and a seven inch 10 ring and a 13 inch nine ring. And then they were kind of scaled up from or scaled, scaled to the yard line. When you got to 300, you shot the same target. So it was a minute and a angle X ring and a minute and a half angle or minute and a quarter angle 10 ring. You got the 600, you had a six inch X ring, you had a 12 inch 10 ring, I believe. And then they scaled it on out and, uh, at a thousand. Like the F class target, it started the, the 10 ring was the X ring. So you get a 10 inch X ring and a 20 inch 10 ring. And in F class, you have a five inch X ring, a 10 inch 10 ring, and, uh, and you go from there. Right. So, so yeah, cause F class started with a, with a long range target as well. And then they cut it in that's half right. when, when everybody was shooting cleans. Uh, um, that's right. Now you guys were shooting. Prone, offhand, kneeling, sitting, sitting, um, <laughs> what? Not much kneeling. <laughs> yeah. Sitting. So what, how much did you guys care about precision, like raw precision of a rifle when you're having to literally hold the rifle? Is that something that went into the equation? Well, sure. You wanted a gun, you know, <clears throat> let's say you put a scope on your rifle. And you're shooting a thousand yards, or I was shooting a thousand yards prone with a sling. Okay. My my heartbeat was about the size of a tennis ball at a thousand yards. And so, you know, you you're you're able to call the shot, break the shot, and if you've got good vision and you've got iron sights, peep sights, let's say, uh, I think that the if you've got excellent vision. Your visual acuity, once, once you master it, you can call a shot within two and a half inches at a thousand yards. So you're, you can hold a quarter minute of angle as you're shooting. Right? And if I shoot, if I went and shot a thousand yards straight, let's say it was unlimited ciders and 24 record, I would probably break maybe one perfect shot in 20. I was able to call my shots for the other 19. But the fact is, is I'm, you know, I, so I called it, it was, you know, a, an exit to a clock. You know, I called it within a two and a half inch hit radius, typically. So that's that, 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 you know, people say minute angle and, oh, I couldn't shoot a thousand yards. Yeah, you can. You know, so if you, if you, if you get at it, and of course, it is a truly. It's there's a lot of seeing involved. You know, I 
I remember we used to you'd be at the thousand yard line and you look at it and you know I I can see a six inch spotter when it's half in the black and half out of the black at a thousand yards with my normal vision. So that means that I'm seeing a third of a minute of angle on the spotter. So it's not it's not a far fetched uh, conclusion that you can sh- you can call within a two and a half inch radius because you've got a hood on or you're looking through something and you're looking through peep sites. And so you can see even better because you've removed an element of the glare from the equation. So when you're out there with cap on, you you still got side vision and glare. So anyway, yeah. Yeah, the, the debate is always, well, we don't need to, you know, I've talked to some sling shooters and they go, well, I don't really care too much about making the ammunition really good because we're, you know, we're ha- holding off yeah. hand or, or, you know, even right. service rifle shooters. And in my head makes no sense. I go, but don't you want the rifle to shoot as good as possible anyway? That way, if you break on the edge, you hit the edge and they go, right. no, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's the, the target's so big and the wobble zone is so big that, you know, having mm-hmm. a good shooting rifle doesn't matter, which doesn't make sense in my head, but you know, no, it, it doesn't. <laughs> well, the other thing to keep in mind is, if you're shooting a semi-automatic AR-15, it, and I remember going to Fort Benning one time and and looking at these targets on the wall, and they had three 600-yard targets, so they had a 6-inch X-ring, a 10-inch 10 ring, or a 12-inch 10 ring, excuse me, and they were 60-shot composite groups. And the groups were 20 shots that were about 4 inches on all three of these 600-yard targets. And I said, that's pretty good. And they were two, two, threes, and 77s, I believe. Okay. And then they had three more targets right beside them. And the groups were about this big. Okay? And they were also 77 grain bullets. And I go, so what's the difference? These they single loaded, those they shot out of the magazine box. Uh, that tells the story right there. Yeah, when you shoot out of the mag, there's there's a lot that happens from the mag to the chamber. I mean, that round there gets is, jammed all around and just gets nicked track. and gets, it's all, you know, it just gets it, all kinds it's of terrible. It's terrible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Terrible. Yeah, yeah. You can do things to, to help eliminate some of that, but you can never fully uh, take that on a semi-automatic gun. That's why, that's why semi-automatic guns, there, there's no... There's no F class guns. Anybody shooting some automatic, you know, especially out of the mag box. There's no currently no ELR guns that people are shooting in semi automatic mode. You know, the, the, the years ago, the joke on the Barrett, you know, the semi automatic Barrett was minute a Humvee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There you go. That's what it was designed for, you know, fit to yeah. So. So, you know, you, you, uh, like I said, I, I've, you know, you did the, the, the whole high power stuff. Then you seem to be transitioning from sport to sport. Do you, do you like get bored with it or what, what keeps you going? Well, you know, the, the obviously age is a factor. I'm not shooting across the course now. I'm not shooting silhouette. Um, uh, I've, I've evolved into the ELR part because obviously you, and, and you, you know, I, I think my rifles probably shoot as right as, as well as anybody's. And so when you shoot ELR stuff, not only do you go through the, the, the gamut of executing the shot and having fantastic ammo, but now you've got all these atmospherics that you can attend to and calling the wind at 2000 yards is a lot different. Calling the wind at a thousand yards, a lot more stuff going on, you know. So, and we were and, and have been relatively successful at that. And so, it's another, it, it's it's something else uh, that challenges you. And uh, I, you know, my son and daughter in law, they they like to shoot it, and I've got a range, so it it, it just comes hand in hand that. That's down the road I would go using a scope now 
now using a bipod, you know, and, and loading for that, you know, per se. And, uh, I, I think that people that shoot and, and I, and I've shot them too. You, know, you shoot targets that are two miles away. There's, there's a degree of luck involved. But if you shoot targets that are, let's say, inside 2,500 yards, you know, you, you can really work, work it. So you, you get a lot of hits. Yeah. Also, it depends on how much the wind's blowing. It depends on the size of the target. You know? So, cause you got to load good ammo. Cause you know, for a, for a, an easy way to equate it is let's say you had a 24, two foot tall target that was at, 2,500 yards, and your gun goes 3,000 feet a second. It's perfect conditions, right? And you're banging away, and you hit that plate, but your rifle changes its velocity 12 feet a second, thereabouts, either faster or slower, any more than that, and you shoot under or over the plate with perfect shots. So, you know, you you got to load some, some decent ammo uh, in order to make that all work. At those distances, uh, but back again, you know, I, I shot a little PRS for a while, just a touch, and uh, the thing that that uh, it, it was a good game. I I liked it. I liked everything, but all the dope sharing. So, you know, I want to shoot this thing cold. You know, walk out and shoot it cold. So. That's what you had to do. That's what I had to do all my life. You, That's one you know, thing that surprised me when I when I shot PRS is how much sharing. It's it's a group it's a group effort, you know. That's right. And uh, me coming from F class, where literally sharing wind calls is illegal. Like it'll get you disqualified, you right. know. And and coming over to PRS where everybody's sharing, everybody's, yeah. you know, you have the first guy to go down, and then they comes off the line. and says, "Hey, I was holding yeah. point four. Okay. Sure. And everybody, and then from sure. there on, everybody just lays mm -hmm. down. And so, so who oh, yeah. really, who really won the match? <laughs> right. Right. Sure. Well, you know, I equate the, you know, obviously I've looked around and, it, and I equate PRS is, is, uh, it's kind of like fence post bench rest. Okay. You got a heavy enough gun and you put it on the fence post and it's pointing in the right direction. That does work. <laughs> fence uh, post Pinterest. <laughs> oh, I'm sure there's going to be a meme about that. <laughs> yeah, I bet so. <laughs> so, uh, but, but but you know what? All that aside, it's a very fun game. I really oh, enjoy. It's it. a great. It's a good sport. You know, yeah. they used to. You know, I recall sh I shot a match called Shoot for the Green in Oklahoma. It was money. You know, it was windy, and I, I remember the. That's probably the last PRS match I shot. And I won the second day with not getting anybody's dope and shooting, you know, my system and so on and so forth. And it's like, wow, look at that. You know, I ought to train this harder. But it's a young guy's sport. It's not an older guy's sport. It's well, some of the get some that, of the get that figured out. Some of the money shoots like the uh what is that called? The A G Cup and some of them, they yep. they right. have banned uh low you know uh sure dope sharing which is right obviously there's a lot of money on the line and and there's uh so right. so they've they've started to address that and i i know some matches mm -hmm. have already started addressing they, that but it's they diff, it's, you, it's difficult you're right uh, no i agree yeah but on the other hand a lot of this you know a lot of prs stuff i believe is shot you know on the eastern side of the united states and all in all it's calmer over there than it is over here yeah that's for that's sure. the advent of the the you know the light the lighter cartridge or or the the six millimeter let's say with the lighter bullet shooting twenty eight fifty or whatever it may be you know there's uh, and yeah and so there, there's there's skill involved uh, there's there's no doubt there's skill oh absolutely yeah there is yeah, uh yeah. no doubt now so your XC was created for across the course that's literally what the XC means across course correct mm -hmm. correct right correct then it started getting adopted by other disciplines right i know uh when i started shooting f class there was a lot of xc's on the line uh, especially was. for mid-range and mm -hmm. uh then prs started shooting the xc so that's right in your opinion what's 
What do you have to say about all these, uh, I'm going to call them redundant cartridges, because yeah. you had the 6XE, and then there was the 6x47 Lapua, right? Mm-hmm. And then there was the, uh, and now we have the yeah. 6 Creed and the 6 GT, and, and they all promise to do things new, yeah. but they're <laughs> they're just the same thing, repackaged. Mm-hmm. So what do you think? drives different shooters to go after the next thing, even though it's really nothing different. Well, you know, keep in mind when I did the 6XC, I did a 6.5XC, I did a 7XC, I did a 22XC, and I tried all that stuff. And so I picked the one that I thought was obviously the best pick for that particular, uh, for what I was doing, right? The 6.5, no matter what anybody says, the 6.5 Freedmore, was a culmination of Dennis DeMille, who worked for Creedmoor Sports, staying in the condominium down the road from Camp Perry, where the Hornaday Bunch was next door. Dennis brought over the 6XC, and guess what? The 6.5 Creedmoor, because they wanted, Creedmoor wanted their own cartridge they could market, because they were selling Tub 2000 rifles at that time. And so that's kind of where the, that all kind of started. So, so to speak. And of course, marketing is a whole lot of it. You know, you know that. Yeah. You know, there's a lot, there's a lot bigger machine pushing a six, five creed more than they pushing his six X eight. And, uh, you know, a lot of culminations. And, you know, I didn't even sent uh, my case drawings to Hornaday to have him quote me brass for a six X C. And so I think you'll see your, or, if you think about it, the, the six Creedmoor didn't come out for some period of time after the six five Creedmoor. And I think that's because they're, those two cartridges are almost too similar, so to speak. So just like the six GT, yeah, that's stuff that's out now that everybody likes. Six GT, great cartridge, you know, but it, so it shoots about three grains less powder than a six XC. I guess it depends on what all you're after. And it's marketing once again. You know, the thing about it is, is that you got to find the primers. You know, it's like it's we go down this ammunition deal. You know, primers are hard to find right now, and so there's a lot more small primers than large primers. And so that's the advent of all the small primer cartridge cases, which could be the Creed Moors, it could be the the GTs, could be the six by forty sevens, can be the six XC. You can get it in a small primer or a large primer. So you, you pick the one that you're going to have access to components. I was doing it. I think they're probably all very active because they're all very similar. Yeah. I mean, when I started shooting PRS, I started with a 6.5 by 47 because that's what I had mm-hmm. and sure. burnt up that barrel. And I immediately went to the 6 by 47 because uh, right. I had the brass. So I just necked it down and, uh, you know, mm-hmm. it. I still have that rifle and it, Right. You know, it shoots great. I use Vitavori N150, and I use right. about 35 and a half grains. I get about mm-hmm. 2975 to 3000 feet per second with a 109. I mean, yep. it's a, you know, it's a great balance. That's right. Uh, mm-hmm. And now after that, I just decided I want to play around. I built a 6BR just because it's so simple. And sure. same thing. They, <laughs> they work great, but, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it keeps it exciting. I believe having different cartridges, uh, I For don't sure. know what else it could be other than people wanting to try different stuff, you know? That's right. You know, well, that's what we do. You know, that's, that's the art of invention or the art of being unique. And it's, you know, and it's always, a, it, it makes you feel good when it works and, and everybody, you know, moves that direction you know you, you you set trends and people follow them you know so and, and i've been fortunate enough to to do some of that yeah something that uh you know obviously your your uh your mindset it's uh slightly different from a conventional sling shooter high power shooter in, in the sense that you like mm-hmm. precision and and the reason i know that is because you actually sell products you know to right. to make rifles more precise you know like i have mm-hmm. your your dual springs your tub springs uh right. you have other products that are geared towards 
making sure. rifles more precise, which like I said, all the, all, you know, seems like everybody that I've talked to that are sling shooters or service rifle, they, they, they seem to not care too much about precision, but you do. No, you're correct. You know, and, and I'll, and we have a, several products that will improve your accuracy. Uh, probably, you know, the most controversial one that we have is the, uh, the the final finish bullets or the TMS bullets, the the sandpaper bullets, for lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. And you've got people that, you know, obviously they they never shoot one through a hand lap barrel and so on and so forth. But you know, if you look at a lot of barrels, and let's just say it's a factory barrel, so you got it. Let's say you've got a final finish kit, it's fifty bullets, and it's aggressive to less aggressive. Through the last batch you shoot, there are what we call burnishing bullets. You lap something in, and you, which is a, is a type of metal finish, and you burnish something. That's a type of metal finish. And so you see that a lot on people who have factory guns. And I remember when we first started, the winner was always a seven millimeter Remington Magnum that shot two inch groups at 100 yards. It was a winner every time. You'd go ahead and shoot the kit through it, and they go down to something less than an inch. For their three shot group. So, and that's the aggressive approach, let's say. And a little bit less aggressive approach would be we pick the, the middle grit, which is the less aggressive, ag aggressive grit. And when you look down your newly chambered rifle and you've got annular tool marks in the lead and the throat, so to speak, then you got little speed bumps and you turn around and you shoot, say, a half a dozen of the less aggressive bullets through it at a lower charge. And then you shoot some regular bullets through it at still lower charge. Your your gun has been broken in in about less than 20 shots, and you cleaned it twice. So there you go. And so to further the aspect of that is, okay, you did that, and it worked. And so what do you do when your 6XC it's got 350 rounds down the tube, but you got a little bit of surface cracking, let's say, just starting. You follow it up, shooting another couple on a periodic basis, kind of like changing the oil in your car. And so at that point in time that you shot 2,000 rounds through your barrel and you shot another four or five TMS treatments of two or three bullets in those particular uh, time frames. Well, guess what? You're you're going to get a little bit more accurate life out of your barrel, maybe a third more, simply because the reason your gun quit shooting is either the bullet jacket's integrity gets compromised, and or it's a rough throat, you get gas leakage around it, and or all of the above. So if you can minimize that, because when you shoot a leg or bullet, it 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 opens or spreads or meets the bore, so if it's smooth to begin with, <clears throat> it's got less chance of gas leakage and or compromise, and so the accurate life of, the, of that, you know, particular rifle barrel will be extended. Yeah, because it's, it's, it's a well-known fact that you can take a barrel that is shot out, you set it back, you know, an inch or so, and all of a sudden it shoots all over right. again. So right. we know the problem area is the throat. So, you know, setting back a barrel eliminates the, the throat completely, but, you know, your bullets, they'll revitalize they'll it, I guess. <laughs> they do. Actually, you do. It's amazing. You go out and shoot a two to three, and it doesn't shoot, and you shoot about a half dozen through it, and, and all of a sudden, it comes right back. There was a high-power shooter named Eric England. He was a sniper, and he held the 1,000-point record for some period of time, and he had a gun. That was a 30 out six. The Marines shot a lot of 30 out sixes with 168s, and he called it Old Yeller. And he sent it back to Hart two or three times, and they lapped the barrel again, and he went right back to shooting it. Didn't didn't change the you know, <laughs> didn't change anything. They just they lapped his barrel. Uh, the barrel makers are really gonna hurt. The barrel makers are really gonna hate you in about after this podcast re and, gets released. And 
And and I'm going to also tell you, you know, I was at the SHOT Show one year, and the F-Class team was going to go to England. And so John Krieger and Middleton are asking me about TMS bullets because their course of fire at that period of time, they're going to be over there, whatever, a couple of weeks, and they're going to shoot 650 rounds, and their throat's going to get a little rougher. So, you know, they were exploring that idea. So you talk about lapping the barrel. And like I said, the, the barrel makers are probably not going to like you after this podcast gets released because I wonder how many calls they're going to get from people wanting to have their barrels relapped. Sure. However, we have obviously the ability to do it ourselves. One is, you know, use your bullets. But what about right. abrasives, you know, cleaning barrel with abrasive? Would it do the same thing to some degree? It, it will to some degree. The thing you need to watch, though, and I remember, you know, I'm sitting here at the in the barrel building, we make barrels out there. We bought Schneider rifle barrels. My daughter and son-in-law did. And so I talked to Gary about it multiple times. And Gary said, you know, and we all know if you've ever used any, uh, um, uh, what am I trying to say? What's the, what's the abrasive cleaner? I also that there, no, uh, JB, JB board, page. JB, JB, yeah, JB's. Gary said he'd, he'd scoped enough barrels. He said, yeah, it cleans is really good. He says, but that actually changes the finish or the texture of the barrel. And in his opinion, and also from my experience, I would never impregnate a bullet with something more than about 250 or 300 grit. Because let's just say, I and, and I've done this, I've coated some bullets with a thousand grit and you shoot them through the barrel, the thing fouls worse. It, it makes it too slick. You can get up a rifle barrel shooting jacketed bullets too slick. Now, there was a guy named Elmer Shook who barreled a lot of guns back in the 60s and the 70s. And Elmer... They, they had a cast bullet match out in California and all the cast bullet shooters would come to him and he cut the back end off a 308 barrel, let's say that much, you know, and of course they'd rechamber it at whatever cartridge they were shooting and they would shoot some of those, uh, thousand grit bullets through it and or clean it that way. And if it's a lead, if it's a lead bullet, it doesn't have a tendency leave the lead fouling of course they were probably shooting bullets whatever you know 1500 feet a second or something all right so so know that 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 a rifle barrel can become too smooth so you don't want to you don't want to and so to that end jb's while it does remove the fouling it's trying to make your barrel because the, the grit's got to be 12 or 1400 on that some somewhere that's in the thousand range, you know, over a thousand lets it do that. But boy, it takes a fouling right out. Yeah, but I've that, never used it, that. That explanation did that make sense? Yeah, I've never used JB bore paste, so I don't know what it's like. But I also yeah. is what I use, and I've talked to Marianne, okay. and she has explained to me again. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not smart enough to understand most of this stuff. <laughs> right. Most of this stuff I, I classify as magic. It just works. But uh, the uh, what she has explained to me is that it's enough to remove the fouling, but not mm -hmm. do anything to the barrel. And I, you know, I don't know how that works. But all right. I know is, and I know people can take everything to an extreme, you know, and they can probably sit there for hours and hours. Uh, lapping barrels or cleaning mm -hmm. but you know right. i don't use i also much i use it every time i clean it but i use it very lightly like just just right. enough to get the stuff out and 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 you know but i try to get it chemically first and if there's anything left then i touch it up and mm -hmm. i hit it i you know i i do about one or two passes with i also and, and that's it right. But, right i haven't had any issues but you know uh again the way marianne explained it is it's it's enough grit to get rid of the fouling but not okay. to hurt the barrel. Okay. Might be worth something to try. Absolutely. So. Yeah. I mean, I use the crap out of it and, uh, I, I, you know, I go through barrels it, quite a bit. Is it foam? Is, is it a foam? No, no, it's a paste. Or? It's a paste. It's a, okay. It's, okay. It's very it's similar like, to JB, but it's supposed to okay. be different than 
JB and right. I've never used JB board pay, so I have no idea what it's like, but I, I right. sure like this IOSO stuff. Mm -hmm. It might be useful. Might yeah. Be useful. You know, you know, so, you know, everybody, uh, the, the one thing that I think a lot of people miss and, and it's obviously, you will say you're using sweets, right? And, uh, Let's say you're using a nylon, a stiff nylon brush, which is probably uh, equally as good or better than a brass brush. I wouldn't have said that five years ago, but they've got it where they, they really, you can't even reverse some of the, those nylon brushes. You can't reverse it in a barrel if it was inside there. You know, it, it will not do it. And, uh, you know, the fact that you've got, if you think about it, so you push your cleaning rod out the front and you put some sweets on it, let's say, and you pulled it back in. Well, you know, gravity's affecting everything. So now the sweets is on the bottom of the brush. So it's going circling unless it's coming around, if it's following the right thing. And so I'm to the point now that when I when I clean a barrel, I have a little uh, piece of plastic pipe that screws on the barrel and it's got a little reservoir in it and I just squirt some sweets in it. So every time that I push the brush out, it gets redosed. It's almost like it's a reservoir. So you can go back and forth and back and forth. And I, I got that idea after one guy said, you know, I, I always thought that I cleaned the bottom half of the barrel better than I cleaned the top half. And he thought gravity has some effect there. But the fact is, is if you can rejuvenate your brush and you're pulling it into the barrel when it's fully coated with whatever you're cleaning it with, it makes more sense that you're going to get more of that in the barrel to it let does. it do its job. It know? does. You know, so, what I've been using lately is that uh, patch out and accelerator. It's a liquid. And if you use okay. the patch out by itself, it's just the liquid, you know, and I brush and I use nylon uh, brushes. I don't ever right. use uh, any other kind. Those nylon brushes work great. But if I just yes, use patch is. out, it works great. But if you add the accelerator, when you're brushing, it becomes a foam. And okay. and that just gets all over everything. Yep. And, and yep. you know, now yep. that you're talking about that, that may be the reason it cleans so good because it just, it, it becomes a foam. Right. It just, it's everything. Well, it's like it's like when I put run a brush in by another, and you look at it, it's got air bubbles in it. So the air bubbles, let's just say, are kind of like when you're spraying Roundup and you want it to stick to the the cot the uh, the cattail, you use a surfactant or a little bit of soap. Well, maybe a little bit of soap is in sweets, or maybe in the stuff you got. Just a drop or two is all it'll take. And it becomes where it tries to bond itself to the brush better. Yeah, it works great. But, uh, yeah, uh, that's interesting for sure. Now, mm -hmm. barrel cleaning, how often, you know, how clean is clean and how often should people clean their barrels? That seems to be, depending yeah. on the discipline, they have different opinions. Sure. Well, it depends on much of a fire-breathing cartridge it is, you know. So if it's a three oh eight, and you looked at it, and, and you broke it in properly, let's say, whatever that may be. And, you know, I, I think you can go over 500 rounds on a 308, especially if it's, a let's say, less than 28 inches and you bore scope it and there's not a there's not a smidge of fouling, copper fouling anywhere, you know. So you turn around and you shoot something that's a longer barrel than 28 and or more of a fire breathing cartridge than a 308 then you've got little patches of copper fouling as it goes out then you need to clean it because you can obviously copper fouling is not necessarily your friend right uh, the cleaner it is the worse it doesn't mean it's not going to show back up there and it doesn't mean your rifle won't shoot over some degree of copper fouling but i think if you you want to work at it so that uh, you minimize that, just have to all to whatever degree you possibly can. So, and the copper fouling, you know, is is basically it's that bullet jacket is reached its maximum velocity toward the end of the barrel, 
and some of that atomized copper that got pulled off, scraped off, or whatever is trying to redeposit itself in the rifling. And uh, it's starting to cool off. Even though it's hot and fast, it's some of those those trace particles are left there. And that's what that's what ends up showing that. Or 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 uh, showing up as the fouling. So, you know, we once again in the in the in the market marketing aspect of it and uh, you know, there are powders out there that are copper inhibitors and copper eliminators. And we we sell a little container that's got some stuff that we call tub dust. I was going to call it gold dust or something, this and that. And there's too many golds in the shooting world. So I just called it tub dust. And basically, you put about 10 grains per pound of powder. And it's the exact same physical reaction that you got when you shot a 16 inch gun on a battleship and it was a it was not a lead core bullet it was a turn solid and they shoved that big thing in there that weighed 2,000 pounds they put in no telling how much powder two or three hundred pounds and they throw a pound of this stuff in that they used in it and that's how you keep the copper falling down randy powell is, is a good guy uh you know him and he told me that he tried some of it in his four forty-five caliber ELR gun. Mm -hmm. He said he could immediate, immediately tell the difference. Hmm. Most people can. Yep. How do you, you mix it in? Sometime. Just just put it in a pound of powder. If you got one pound of powder, just put 10 grains in and shake it up. You can get rid of fouling with... The lead that's exposed on the, or, or reduced copper fouling, okay? The lead that's exposed on the back of a bullet atomizes. So lead will do it. Bismuth will do it. Tin will do it. Anything like that. Just a minute amount with the powder. Interesting. Yep. Uh, so, you know, you, you also have, uh, you know, you live through the whole molly coated area and hbn and sure what do you think about all these bullet coatings well you know i probably coated more bullets than anybody uh because i used to coat the bullets for sierra so we do several million a year at the height of the molly thing uh i i think that the hbn stuff is is the better compound because it doesn't outgas till it gets pretty hot i think over 2000 degrees, right? Uh, and, you know, it's got to reduce the friction because it's got some lubricity characteristics. And, you know, the, the Molly craze, and then I'll just, just touch on this because nobody talked about it much, but uh, Namo Lapua Rafas wanted to do a test with Molly. And Norma was big on Molly for a long time. And so they did 144 grain Sierra bullets in a 6.5 by 55. And they sent me the same lot of bullets and I coated them with Molly. And they shot two identical 6.5 by 55s in their test. And it, the, and the test results were in Norwegian or Swedish or it was, it was so I had to get somebody to interpret. But basically, to cut to the chase, the gun that shot the Molly started its life where it didn't shoot quite as good as the other barrel, the test barrel that shot the bear bullets. At 4,500 rounds, the test, the gun shooting the bear bullets was done. And at 6,500 rounds, the rifle that was shooting the Molly shot the same size groups as it did when it was new. That's when they broke the test. It's like, wow, that lube, that lubrication made a difference. So to summarize that, summarize that the bear bullet gun was over at 4,500. The Molly barrel went to 6,500, shooting the same size groups it did when it was new. And they didn't shoot quite as good as the other. So, yeah, I think that's why the F class community kind of gave up on the bullet coating because. They noticed that the barrels would last longer, but obviously they're chasing the most precision possible, and they just didn't seem to shoot as good. 
Well, the thing is, is if you have a humidity condition, Molly doesn't like humidity. And so if, if you shoot the first shot, let's say you shot a string and your gun is dirty and cold and you go shoot a string and the humidity's let's say 50%, it, the Molly gun, the Molly shooting gun typically will throw the first shot a little bit low. Right? Second shot right back in the group. Okay. That's something to do with the atmospherics, the, 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 uh, the HBN stuff or the TBN stuff, I call it, because we use a little bit of a mix of everything. Doesn't do that. Typically doesn't throw the first shot. Puts it in the same velocity range and in the same group. And it's a lubrication. So anyway. Yeah. So you gotta try try it to see if you like it, you know? Yeah. Not everything works for everybody, you know. So Yeah, it just has to fit in your system. You know, that's I, I tell people that all the time. You know, what do you think about this or that or the other? Try it. <laughs> you know, it doesn't work sure. for me, but that doesn't mean it doesn't work for you. So that's right. Give it a try. See if it works. Now, speaking of uh, controversial topics, <laughs> uh, <laughs> barrel tuners. Yeah. You know, where are you at on that? I know back in the day, the, the sling shooters and, you know, I was talking to Brandon Green and he says to this day, they, they take the their bloop tubes and, and their sights and they kind of move them back and forth uh Mm -hmm. until they get the best groups where are you at on the the tuner discussion so what is a barrel tuner a barrel tuner is a device that attaches to the end of the barrel that allows you to tune the barrel harmonics in order to shrink your groups as best as possible there are multiple types here at cortina precision we have what we call the next generation easy tuner brake this is a tuner and a muzzle brake combined now if you're simply looking for a barrel tuner or your let's say rimfire rifle or even an air rifle then the easy tuner v2 is probably going to be the best option for you this tuner uses a spring to eliminate backlash and provide the most repeatable results in order for you to attach it to your rifle you can either have the barrel threaded by a gunsmith to attach the tuner directly but that requires an inch 250 barrel or you can use one of our adapters. These adapters come threaded in multiple different threads, half 20, half 28, three quarter 24. So you can attach this tuner to just about any barrel out there, including your rimfire or your air rifle. Visit shootsmallgroups.com, go to our store and take a look around. Also, you can go on YouTube and search for Easy Tuner and you'll see a lot of videos out there that show what our tuners can do for you. Well. You know, I make a muzzle brake or a couple of muzzle brakes, and mine are tunable brakes to the fact that, let's say there's an inch of thread, and you got a trailing, you have a trailing locking nut, and so you put it on. So let's just say the front of the barrel is even with the back of the brake. You can look in the ports, shoot a group, break it loose, roll it out a turn. Shoot a group, break it loose, roll it out a turn. It's much kind of like a Browning boss, even though this is a directional break. You, if, if you shoot half a dozen turns out, you're going to find one of those turns. Probably your, your, the ammunition you're shooting will shoot better groups. You may find two that it likes, okay? but it's definitely better. And I'm not so sure. Uh, obviously, let's say it's a tuner. And let's say it's the vibration or the sine wave, like the bullet going down the barrel. But let's also say that it's maybe just matching the bullet that you're shooting to the port you're going, the very first port you're going through. Right? Because if you look at an ELR gun, the bullets are this long. So that means that that bullet is going through that first blast panel before the back of the bullet left the barrel. Is that a good thing or that a bad thing? I don't know. But I, I'm not so sure you're not tuning the blast ports or the initial one to something that the barrel likes. And I'm also a big fan of a, you know, a vertical blast port or a 90-degree blast port, certainly for the first port. Yeah. Because it's going to get, it's going to let push, you know. Yeah. My brakes have a, the first one is 90 degrees. Yeah. Uh, and it also has an expansion chamber. Mm-hmm. 
Now, if yep. you want to, if you want a yep. muscle break with a tuner, I make that. If you just want a tuner, I make that as well. Obviously, the XC stood for across the course, but I'm sure your three uh, 33 XC is probably not very suited, very well suited for across the course. Well, it stands for something different. What does it stand for? Der- Derek Peterson goes extra capacity. There you go. <laughs> yeah, and it does. You know, it turns around and it, uh, the 33 has been a pretty, you know, that's an ELR cartridge, of course, and it shoots, uh, it'll shoot 125 grains of powder or more, depends if you got a, you know, drop tube or so on. And people have, you know, done really well. Now they have a light class and they have a heavy class and it pretty much dominates the light class. Of course, you only shoot a cartridge or a barrel diameter of 33 or less. In that so, but like the top 20 shooters, the last couple of you know world championship things, which you know, it's it's got you know 18 or 20, 18 of 20, excuse me, in there. So that means it's uh, it's, it's well accepted, yeah. And it's I, good, you know, I, I i actually commercially load 33XC with a loading machine that weighs to the within a what weighs to with a, with a kernel. So there was factory loaded ammo for that. That's uh yeah. Uh, Chase Stroud was here and he he was talking about the XC about how dominating it is in uh you know light gun or light glass it, ELR. Yeah, the rest of that's a big, you know the big guns, the big ELR, ELR, which is fine, but you know they're just you have to, you need a fifty pound gun to stand the recoil. You know, eight hundred grain bullets at three thousand feet a second or. You know, that's, that's saying something so, as opposed to a 300 grain 33 XC bullet at say 3,100 feet a second. It's not that bad. Now where, uh, you know, you, so you have your 33 XC and now the ELR, so, you know, they have two classes. Now they have King of one mile, King of two miles. And, uh, right. what do you think about the format? Uh, and the scoring system, because that's what I kind of hear. You know, obviously, I'm not in that sport, but I hear people kind of sure. complain about, number one, how you draw mm-hmm. for shooters, and number two, the scoring system. Yeah, it's it's that's exactly right. You know, you look at the, the at the king of two mile, which shot in Raton. Well, you've shot in Raton. I've shot in Raton on multiple times, you know. You know, all kinds of bad things happen downrange shooting a thousand yard of Palma matches. Let's, let's say at about 1130 in the morning. <laughs> so that's when it goes, you know, and the fact that you're shooting at the side of a hill or a mountain, however you want to call it, and you can't read the conditions all the way out, you know, on the side of the mountain, you can't do it. And so it's, uh, it's, let's just say it's, it has a, a great deal to do with how your shooting order is, is, is attained, you know? So, yeah. Whereas you turn around and you shoot a match out, let's say at my range, it would say we shoot 2,500 yards. You can read the Mirage all the way out to 2,500 yards. So, you know, obviously the, the faster the wind blows and so on and so forth. But, you know, if you had and you paired it up like you and I, we're going to shoot. We shoot the same time, with the same two targets. Okay? And the one who hits the most advances. The guy who does it, he gets moved to a different class, you know, or different different competing. That's how that we makes do the, it worth it's a level playing field. That's how we do the V two finale in F class. We uh we yeah. head to head competition. You know, same target, sure. same uh uh. Same conditions, same everything, yeah. same time, and you know it's it's pair fire, but it's right. it's it's elimination, so it's double it's elimination. Fair. Right, you lose it's twice, fair. you're out. It does. It's not an yeah. aggregate score, so mm-hmm. it doesn't matter. Both of you can drop ten points, and That's right. if one dropped right. eleven, mm-hmm. and it doesn't hurt yeah. you, you got a winner and a loser. Oh, Correct. That's right. Correct. Yeah. No, that's the way it ought to be. Yeah, and. You could do that, and it really doesn't matter what the distance is. Then, is it fifteen hundred or is it twenty five hundred? You know, whatever. Uh, I think that's the way to run it. And I know uh, there are others that have talked about that. You know, sure. 
Yeah. I'd, I'd like to see I'd like to see that happen. Way, yeah, Paul Currently, Phillips was talking about that. Ours. Paul Phillips was talking about that, you know, he mm -hmm. liked that format, the, the head sure. to head format. That's right. I like that. I like that too. It was like silhouette. And when you shot silhouette and you ended up in the day, what'd you do? If you have tied somebody, you had shoot offs. Same thing. Yeah. That's why at Camp Perry, they have shoot offs where they shoot the thousand yard stuff. Then they, then they, the, the high scoring on the relay. You know, whatever particular discipline you're shooting ends up in a shoot off. And whoever wins the shoot off wins the match, no matter what the score was previously. If they have a high shoot off score, then they're golden. So, same, same thing makes it fair. Yeah, for sure. Well, David, uh, I really appreciate your time. Uh, I know we barely scratched sure. the surface. We, we, uh, we may have to do this again. I know there's so yeah, much more yeah. that you, you, you got, you got to offer for the shooting community. Uh, um, well, there, there, there's some stuff in the, yeah, there's, there's quite a bit of stuff. Yeah. Now, Just like, the, you know, we talked about cartridges and this and that and the other, but you know, somebody's <laughs> starting out a new shooter and they, they want to try, I don't know, let's just say, uh, PRS or F class or whatever. Uh, there's two schools of thought, right? One of them is get a really cheap rifle, kind of factory ammo, right. and go shoot. Sure, which okay. I'm okay with. Uh, it gets if it gets you out shooting, get it done, mm -hmm. right? But there's a lot to be said for the feedback, especially when you're trying to read the wind or learn how to read the wind. Mm -hmm. of a bad rifle you know a bad rifle is one that shoots pretty big and and you know people people forget the flyers happen in every direction and they mm -hmm. assume they only go up and down they also go side to side so it may sure. it may trick you into thinking you just missed the wind when in reality it was just the gun that shot it that right. way so what kind of if somebody wants to get somewhat serious about shooting sports should they start with like a factory rifle or should they just go ahead and pony up and and, and get a quality rifle i i think there's enough quality rifles out there floating around that if they can buy one to start with that they'd probably be better off because it's got it you know obviously you're starting with pretty decent components and let's say let's say you need to replace the barrel that's all you got to do and uh go from there you know, I think I think that would be better. Uh, but, you know, if you if a factory gun, you could say some of the stuff that I've made was a factory gun. I'd start with a factory, one of those kind of factory guns. But one of those kind of factory guns is not going to be a fifteen hundred dollar rifle. So pick pick what works. I'd say, you know, the best thing you can do probably on anybody do shooting sports is go to the matches if you have an interest and befriend somebody who's loan you some equipment. And that's pretty simple. You can get that, you can get that done. Just, you know, you just got to go out and shake hands and express an interest and somebody will take you under the wing likely. For you know, sure. It's, it's a forgiving sport. Yeah. It's a fun sport. It's uh the, you know, it's, it's a, uh, it's a big family. Everybody helps each other. So mm -hmm. for sure, somebody's going to help you and, uh, just go and that's right. Just borrow some gear and uh, just hang on yep. tight because it's going to get addicting. <laughs> sure, it will. <laughs> no matter which one you pick, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. David, uh, I always ask my uh, guests to uh, recommend who I should have on the show next. So, do you have anybody that you would recommend that I have on the show? Uh, you know, I would probably do Nate and Christy, my daughter and son-in-law. I don't know how many barrel guys you have on them, you know, but he, uh, uh, Nate was in the Navy, retired, and he was, a uh, he was a really good SEAL, let's put that away, okay? And when he was out jumping, I knew Gary wanted to sell his business, and so when Nate was out jumping out of perfectly good airplanes, Tucson, he'd go up on the weekends and visit with Gary, and so... They did that for a while, and that's how the Schneider Barrel eventually evolved, being moved here to Canadian Texas. And so I think maybe that might be a. They, he's pretty fresh. Both of them are. They're both ELR shooters, and uh, you know they they might have for a different 
a different look at barrel making. Yeah. I don't know if you had a lot of you had block barrel makers or not, but you know, the one that always got me was okay. So you got cut rifle barrels, uh, button rifle barrels, hammer forge barrels. And so everybody's got their own, I guess, side of the fence they're on. But the one that always stood out for me is, is Gary Schneider said, you know, here we go. When we pull this button through there and we're forming the steel, we're work hardening the steel and we're, we're imparting, let's say somewhere in the 160,000 PSI range. <clears throat> on that barrel blank, because you look at the very end of it with crown is the, the metal is actually formed further than the squareness of the crown on, on the blank when they're making it. And he said, then you turn around and you shoot a 65,000 PSI projectile through it. He said, didn't even know it went through there. So that's something to be a bear or not, you know, so, which is different than the other ones, the other barrel making methods per se. So, yeah. So what anyway, is the what yeah. is it what is the company called now? Still Schneider Rifle Barrels. Oh, okay. It, Kept it's the just thirteen. It's just thirteen steps from my building. Okay. Very nice. <laughs> well, I'll so, uh, that's I'll, that's I'll who I've, I've tried. Yeah, that yeah. sounds interesting. David, thank you very much for being here. And uh, man, stay uh, stay sharp, man. Keep them centered. You too. Thank you, Eric. You have a great day.